Good morning. Welcome again to our Ever Wonder Wednesday time as we receive a couple questions today and we continue to answer them as best as we can. Again, as always, we'll provide links for more reading and uh, probably better answer to the questions uh, in, in those links. But also as a reminder, uh, if you have any particular questions that you'd like answered, please feel free to send them in. We'll be glad to uh, get them up and uh, hopefully provide some some help to you. Now, this morning, uh, the two questions that we have are both dealing with judging. And as we think about that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks for you have shown unto us that we who do not deserve your mercy have received more than enough to get through this life. And to God, we pray that you would provide in your blessed truth a testimony unto our hearts and our souls of the assurance of your peace. And to God, we ask that you would help us to understand uh, these issues that we're going to talk about today uh, a little better, uh, that we may better serve you. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, this morning, the two questions that we have had sent in, uh, one via email and the other on Twitter, has to do with uh, the statement in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 3, about the judging of angels. And then we had a question, uh, again, from email, asking how to deal with unbelieving in-laws. Now, I'm going to take that second question second, but I'm also going to expand a little bit and just talk about how to deal with unbelieving family members. Now, let's go ahead and go to that first question. If you will, uh, you can turn with me. There to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 3, and we'll look there at verse 6. Now, the context, uh, or chapter 6, verse 3, I should say. Now, the context of this passage has to do with <clears throat> dealing with the whole question of judgment. Now, chapter 5 of the book of 1 Corinthians deals with this man who was caught and promoted within the church of Corinth uh, having an illicit sexual relationship with his mother-in-law. And Paul there is very clear, first of all, of the nature of the wickedness of the sin. But then towards the end of chapter 5, he talks about the necessity of immorality being judged by the church. And that the church needs to be able to deal with its own problems within itself. And that God has provided the means by which to do that. Now, we all have heard, I'm sure, of Matthew 18 and the steps of discipline or the steps of treating somebody who's engaged in open sin. Right? You're to go to them. They refuse your counsel. You're to take two or three. They refuse that counsel. Then, they're, then you bring them in front of the elders. If they refuse that counsel, then you are to cast them out, right? That's the pattern that Paul follows here in 1 Corinthians 5. And so 1 Corinthians 6 begins with a question about going to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints. Now, we in the ARP wrote a position paper on this whole question uh, that I'll link in the uh, in the video that has to do, again, with this idea of how brothers in Christ should deal with troubles between one another. And what we see here, it says, Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Now, what's the problem with that? What is the problem with taking a church matter to a secular court? Well, first of all, a secular court is not set up either by God or by the state to deal with interchurch or interchurch matters. You're not to go to the civil magistrate over whether or not to have wine or grape juice in the Lord's Supper. Right? What is the standard of judgment for that? It's not the U.S. Constitution. Right? It is the law of God. Right? It's what God has provided in his word for his people to not only uh, find a solution to these issues, but that is where, again, the yes and no, the right or wrong, is to be found within the body of Christ. And so then Paul, in verse 2 and 3, 
kind of makes an argument towards why this is the case. Why Christians should take care of their own affairs within the body of Christ and should not take it to outside arbiters. So we see here in verse 2, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? So again, the first statement is, do you not know that you will judge the world? Now, what does Paul mean by this? Well, think about what Jesus has told the disciples and the apostles and the gospels. What does he tell them about judgment? You remember that he tells them that they will judge the world, right? The 12 tribes uh, of Israel will be judged by the 12 apostles. Now, obviously, uh, Judas is not one of those, but the the statement there, again, of judgment has to do uh, with the authority that God has given to the church. And, of course, not only the church, but when it comes to the end of days, what is the judgment day going to look like? Well, one of the things that we take from the Bible not just from that passage from the Gospel of John, but also, for instance, in in Jude 14 and 15, we hear the uh, Apostle Jude speak of this judgment of the world. Now, how do we do that? Well, first of all, when the last day of judgment comes, one of the things that the Bible teaches is going to happen is that... All of men's sins and all of their evil and all of their works will be laid bare for all the world to see. And as part of that, of course, there will be witnesses involved. And the witnesses towards those evil things will testify against others. So that's one of the ways that we see this judgment taking place. They will witness for instance, the 12 apostles against the apostasy and wickedness of the 12 tribes of Israel in the days in which they lived. And we see this repeated in verse 3 of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Do you not know that we should judge angels? How much more things pertain to this life? So this question of judging angels, right? First of all, we have to ask what kind of angels are we talking about? We're obviously talking about fallen angels. There would be no reason for us to judge the good angels because what have the good angels not done? The good angels have not sinned. So there was no need for judgment. Right? Jesus did not come to, to condemn but to save, right? Because there's no need to condemn those who are righteous. Now, how will believers judge the angels? Well, it's just like what Paul said in verse 2 about the world. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Well, in the day of judgment, not only are the reprobate thrown into the lake of fire, but all of the fallen angels will be judged and thrown into perdition for all of eternity. And so just as we will witness against those who have done evil against us, we will also witness against the angels who have tormented us throughout our Christian life. Whether you know, they be, you know, uh, whatever rank of angels they might be, if, you know, if, if we would believe in such a thing as if there are, you know, more powerful angels than other angels. But generally speaking, right, the, the demons and the devils who uh, bother you every day, who encourage you to sin, who invite you to engage in wicked deeds and in wicked things, they will be judged on the day of judgment for that work just as the godly angels will be commended by the Lord our God for their work in the protection of God's people. You know, angels and the whole doctrine of angels can uh, lead lead us into some strange places. And if we're being honest, it's not something that we spend a lot of time biblically thinking about. We kind of let culture, hallmark, and things like that dictate how we understand these things to work. Uh, But the Bible certainly teaches not only are angels active in the world today, but that there are good angels and bad angels involved in warfare for your very soul. They are the minions of the devil. They are walking upon the earth looking who they might devour. And 
for Christians, what enables us to withstand the temptations of the devil sent in the wicked angel, right? We believe that it's not the good angels that give us that power, right? But that the good angels do protect us and do watch over us and do care for us. That's one of the reasons why, for instance, in the book of Hebrews, we're told that you know, we are to do good to all men because we don't know what when we're entertaining angels. And what that, again, is pointing to in regards to the 1 Corinthians uh, 6.3 passage is this reminder that, first of all, right, this is in the context of things within the church, you know, if we have the right and the ability to judge the angels, then we should have the right and the ability to judge issues within the body of Christ. And so, like I said, we'll provide more reading and information on that, but to kind of summarize things and move on to the second topic, you know, this statement about the judgment of angels has to do with our bringing, fault, our bringing witness against wicked angels for their attempts to lead us astray. And in fact, one of the things that we'll testify is, is when they were successful in leading us astray. Because you know, that's a condemnation upon them. And so what are we to do with the wicked angels? Well, one of the reasons, one of the things we need to do is we pray for the Holy Spirit to bring not only strength, uh, but a watchful eye over our souls that we might withstand in his power the attempts of evil angels to lead us astray. Let's go ahead and turn to our, our second question, which has to do with uh, what to do with unbelieving angels. You know, relatives, uh, uh, especially in-laws. You know, the, the question that, that has come, you know, is a difficult one because, you know, the, the reality is, is that I'm sure this is true for a number of you. You know, either your parents or your wife's parents are not believers in Jesus Christ. And you have to spend a lot of time with them, whether... Uh, at Christmas or Thanksgiving or or uh, other holidays, birthdays, uh, etc. And the question of your personal faith is going to come up. And we need to be able to deal with that in a wise way, in a loving way, and in a careful way. Now, to start off, there's three basic things that we need to think of when it comes to dealing with unbelievers in general, but especially those of our own family. First of all, what are Christians called to do for their persecutors? And, you know, I use that word advisably. Uh, you know, persecutors is a kind of a general way of talking about those who are outside the faith and who are going to cause issue in regards to your testimony and your obedience to Christ. What's the first thing we're supposed to do? The Bible tells us we are to pray for our persecutors. Now, what kind of prayers are we to pray for our in-laws or our relatives that don't believe in Jesus? Well, the first thing we should pray for is for their salvation, right? Our primary concern should be that they no longer are unbelievers. Now, just as a, a word here, you know, I'm very blessed with having uh, a wonderful in-laws and a wonderful family who confess Christ. Um, and so... The question then becomes, we pray for our in-laws and our family who don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, how are we to witness to those among our family who don't believe in Jesus? Well, the, the, one of the primary ways that we witness to unbelieving relatives is by living the Christian life ourselves. You know, they see us at our most uh, personal, right? Not just because they're near us all the time, but they know us better than in many cases we know ourselves. And so they see us and our conduct uh, in family functions. They see us and hear about our conduct from our wives or our husbands or our children. And so they need to see that your faith means something to you. So not only are you to pray for them that they might know the Lord Jesus Christ, but you must exhibit the goodness of Jesus in your life. And so we, we pray for them, we exhibit Christ, and thirdly, we don't you know, hide the truth from them. 
right? That, that can be an easy thing to do, uh, to talk in a way to our in-laws as if hell doesn't exist, as if uh, they're going to get into heaven by their relationship to us, right? Now, there's obviously a wise way to do that and an incorrect way to do that. Right? The Bible never tells us to be a jerk. Now, the Bible also tells us never to hide the truth. And so we should be concerned for the salvation of those nearest and dearest unto us. And we should be concerned that they come to know Jesus Christ as Savior. And we should use the opportunities that God gives us to witness the gospel to them. Now, in many cases, the only time we see some of our relatives is at funerals. Now, funerals are the perfect opportunity to talk about Jesus Christ and to talk about the hope that we have in death. In Jesus Christ. But again, wisdom has to be paramount. You don't lead your relative up to the body of your dead relative and you know, use that opportunity uh, unwisely and create division and trouble uh, in the midst of these things. But again, we can positively speak of the goodness of Jesus Christ and the way that, you know, especially if the individual was a believer, that we can have hope in the midst of the darkness. And, you know, when we also think about that, you know, how we go about witnessing to unbelieving relatives and unbelieving um, uh, you know, in-laws or, or whatever relation they might be, is we have to show genuine concern for them. The, there's a, a way in which we can approach our unbelieving relatives as just another conquest, right? Just another tally mark to put on the list, right? I got Aunt Sally to believe in Jesus. You know, they're going to know the difference between genuine concern and just a desire to get them on your team. And so when we consider these things again, we need to again always go back to the Bible. You know, and think about how Jesus uh, talked to his own uh, brothers in the midst of these things. You know, in, in John chapter 7, he says, And after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea, because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the feast, Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. His brother, brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe in him. Then Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. Notice what he does there. You know, they're telling him to go to Jerusalem and witness to people so that they can see what uh, he's doing. <laughs> what does Jesus say to his brothers? Again, look there at, at verse uh, 6. My time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. He's calling upon them to believe in him. He's saying to them, look, you know, my mission field's right here. I don't have to go to Jerusalem. I need to talk to you about who I am and what I have come to do so that you might not only receive eternal life, but that you might not just be my brothers in the flesh, but that you might be my brothers in the spirit. And, of course, we know that several of Jesus' brothers and a number of his family came to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, on the negative side, you know, one of the things about having unbelieving relatives is that it can cause uh, great sorrow in your heart. And we see this with the Apostle Paul in Romans 9 when he begins to talk about Israel. He says there, I tell the truth in Christ, I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, who retain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises, of whom are the fathers, and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. You know, there's a deep hurt 
in Paul when he talks about the Jews who have not come to faith and do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it should bother us that our relatives don't believe in Jesus. And it should be a concern of ours that they come to faith. And we need to be active in seeking the salvation of our brothers and our sisters in the flesh. Because what do we want them to be? What did Jesus want with his brothers? He wanted them to be his brothers in the spirit. Remember what he says when his mother and his brothers come to get him that one day. Who is my brother? Who is my mother? And what does he say there? Those who follow me and do my commandments. Those who believe in me. Those who love me. Not as a brother in the flesh, but as the son of the living God. The only way to the Father. Well, as we close today, again, we think about this judging of angels and this difficult uh, subject of uh, dealing with unbelieving relatives. Uh, may we again pray unto the Lord for wisdom. May we love one another in Christ. And may we love our neighbor as ourselves. So let us seek the salvation of our brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, aunts and uncles, cousins in the flesh that we might know them in an even better way. Take care and God bless.